Chris? What the hell? Sorry, Ethan. No! What? Why? Welcome to Mojo Plays, and today, we're going sleuthing to find the 10 biggest mysteries in Resident Evil games. For this list, we'll be looking at questions we have about the long-running series that have yet to be answered, and possibly never will be, as the games just keep coming and spreading like the virus that started it all. There will be spoilers ahead for the entirety of the Resident Evil series. What's your biggest unanswered question about the Resident Evil series? Have any theories of your own? Share them down in the comments. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. Umbrella. Commitment, honesty, integrity, these are the core values that create the foundation for Umbrella. The true extent of the Umbrella Corporation and its seemingly endless secret laboratories may never be fully known, but that's not the biggest mystery that still plagues the organization as the series continues. After Spencer Mansion and the subsequent destruction of Raccoon City, Umbrella took their experiments underground, and while mercenary groups like the BSAA hunted down the company's many scientists and mutations, they never seemed to be gone for good, continuously reappearing like a hydra created in their labs. When you chop off one head, two more appear in its place. It seems that even though the company no longer exists, its influence and presence is still felt throughout the RE universe. That's irrelevant. We must make sure no knowledge of this gets out. Sherry's immunity. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't understand you. You need help. Why? He's right behind you. When she was just six, Sherry's father had become horribly mutated, her hometown become overrun by the undead, and on top of everything, she became infected with a parasite and nearly died before Claire was able to get her treatment. All of this forced her into hiding until Wesker's death, and then once she was tasked with tracking down Wesker's son Jake, her immunity to not only the T-Virus and its many counterparts, but also her ability to self-heal is revealed to him. The question remains, however, whether her immunity and subsequent healing abilities can be transferred or shared with others, and if her condition is due to her exposure to the parasite or the vaccine that saved her life. It currently seems that only a handful of people know of Sherry's condition, and since she hasn't been seen in the series since Resident Evil 6, we may never know the extent of her mutation. With the data now in the right hands, things seem to be finally settling down. Is there a cure? So Sherry's gonna be alright? She'll be weak for a little while, but... Yes. She's free of the G-Virus. Did you hear that? Ever since the first outbreak that started in the Spencer Mansion before infecting Raccoon City, and then somehow managed to spread throughout the world in its various forms, the biggest question that has never been answered is will there ever be a cure? What began as simply the T-Virus and its many mutations and zombie outbreaks has since evolved into all manner of nightmarish forms such as the Plague of Parasite in Resident Evil 4. However, given the widespread nature of the infections and its many forms, is a cure even possible? We've seen numerous attempts at a cure, such as Jake Mueller's blood being synthesized into a vaccine for the C-Virus in Resident Evil 6, but as the series continues and the virus infinitely mutates, is there an all-encompassing vaccine in sight that can finally cure the world of this nightmare? Chris, he's got antibodies for the C-Virus. I got it. On my way. Jake Mueller. No question. You've got the antibodies. Thank you very much. Wait, what? You could be the key to saving this world, Jake Mueller. Somehow, even while being a two-faced backstabbing double-crosser, Albert Wesker found time to get busy and had a son that wasn't created in a lab. This didn't last, however, as both members of the family and the U.S. government sought out Jake Mueller for his blood to use for their own respective reasons. Much like Sherry Birkin, Jake's immunity is a driving motivator for his pursuers, and eventually Jake chooses the side not trying to keep him trapped in a lab, and gives Sherry a pint of his blood to create a vaccine for the C-Virus. However, for such an important character and the continuation of the Wesker bloodline, 
To date, Jake has only ever appeared in Resident Evil 6 as one of a handful of playable mainstays. What happened to him after the events of RE6, and are there still shadowy organizations hunting him? We may never know. You know what? I'm not my father. I'm gonna make damn sure that it stays that way. The BSAA. I'm Redfield. I'm glad we found you. After the Raccoon City incident and the dismantling of the Umbrella Corporation, Chris Redfield joined the Bioterrorism Security Assessment Alliance formed by the United Nations to shut down any remaining Umbrella Labs that were still in operation. Chris seemingly remained part of this organization through the events of Resident Evil 5 and 6, but in 7, Chris had joined forces with Blue Umbrella and is combative with BSAA agents on scene during the ending moments of Resident Evil 7. Working with Umbrella is going to take some getting used to on my part. I know it must be difficult, and to tell the truth, a lot of our members have been with us since even before we reincorporated as a PMC. About all that's left now is the name. Even more questionable is radio chatter towards the end of Village, which reveals that the BSAA is now using bioweapons themselves. What exactly transpired between Resident Evil 6 and 7 that would lead the UN-sanctioned organization to seemingly go rogue and become the enemy? Is Blue Umbrella part of a new Umbrella Corporation formed to battle a BSAA infiltrated by former Umbrella operatives? All of this has yet to be explained. BSAA didn't send soldiers. This is a bioweapon. The hell were they thinking? Jill Valentine. <laughs> One of the original STARS members to uncover the Umbrella Corporation's many mutated experiments, Jill escaped the collapsing Raccoon City and made it her mission to fight Umbrella in their labs, as well in the courts, only to be suspiciously absent in modern Resident Evil titles. And yet despite her popularity and likable tenacity, her last leading entry in the franchise was Resident Evil Revelations and her last mainline entry appearance was under Wesker's control in Resident Evil 5, where she remained unplayable. After RE5, there hasn't even been a mention of her after she was sent to a BSAA lab for testing due to Wesker's control besides an email to Barry complaining of boredom sitting in a lab all day. We can only hope that in the inevitable RE9, Jill will be taken off the bench, but until then, we'll keep hanging Jill Valentine missing posters. It's finally over. So long, RC. Megamycete. Alpha the squad. I've located the Megamycete. So now we can end this mess after all. About damn time. Discovering Mother Miranda's plans for Baby Rose turned out to only be half the shocking reveals in Resident Evil Village. As players discover the Mega Mycete and its subsequent usage in developing the T virus for Umbrella. The enormous beating heart of the fungus has made its home within the mountains outside the village and seems to be an unending source of mutation powers for those looking to exploit it. However, it's never explained just what the Mega Mycete is or where it came from. A couple of the most likely explanations are either it is a natural mutation of some ancient fungi or it's some sort of parasite from outer space. In a series like Resident Evil, anything is possible. While Village didn't provide many answers about the Mega Mycete itself, and likely never will considering its apparent destruction at the end of the game, it's possible this is part of an ongoing plot point, or it could just be a MacGuffin to explain the virus's numerous abilities throughout the series. Oh no. Chris. Ethan. He did it. It's finished. I think we've finished each other. The Duke. Uh, I've been waiting for you, Mr. Winters. How do you know my name? Anyone who is anyone has heard of the likes of you. The Duke has wares if you have coin. So, what are you buying? Much like the merchant in Resident Evil 4, the Duke seems only interested in lining his own pockets regardless of the horrors transpiring around him. Who he is and how he manages to seemingly teleport around the village are never explained, and even any question that Ethan asks the Duke directly goes 
was unanswered. Fans have speculated that he may be a mutation created by Mother Miranda, similar to how the merchant appears to be a Ganado who is unaffected by the Lost Plagueis, like the rest of the villagers, but there is no evidence to support this. His callback to the merchant himself is also interesting, implying that they have either crossed paths or both work within the same organization who specialize in infiltrating infected areas to peddle their wares. Oh, we meet again. Duke, why are you here? Where there's coin to be made. <laughs> Ethan Winters. You don't understand how special he is. By far one of the most shocking revelations to come out of Resident Evil Village was that the Ethan Winters players had been controlling was not in fact Ethan Winters, but was in fact the mold that had infected the Baker family living on as Ethan. Mia explains to Chris that Ethan was killed by Jack Baker, but the mold brought him back to life, and she has known all along that Ethan died in the Baker house, but that raises even further questions about how no one besides Mia knows not even Ethan himself. After their exposure to the mold in the Baker home, Ethan and Mia had to have undergone extensive testing for residual effects, so how was Ethan's condition not found out? Ethan himself doesn't even seem to question how he can miraculously reattach limbs and survive innumerable physical attacks that should have killed him, so I suppose, why should we? <sighs> ah, shit! Resident Evil canon. I gotta say, I'm surprised you made it this far. It'd be a shame if something happened to you now. Not counting multiplayer titles and remakes, there are roughly 18 Resident Evil games that all supposedly take place in the same universe within different timelines. While all of these are seemingly considered canon, not all of them are necessary to understand the overall and ongoing story within the Resident Evil universe. However, many of these are headlined by series veterans such as the Revelations titles featuring Jill Valentine, Claire Redfield, and Barry Burton, but somehow these entries aren't necessarily part of the mainline canon and aren't mentioned at all by the numbered entries. However, even these entries add to the overall narrative of the Resident Evil universe, building up background events that can affect the mainline titles without those games ever formally recognizing their efforts. Given the expansive lore of the Resident Evil universe, it's just curious how so many games can manage to be necessary, but inconsequential at the same time. If I die, you'll never find out the truth. I don't mind a little detective work. Did you enjoy this video? Check out these other clips for Mojo Plays, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.